I gotta move my food. Uh, so, <laughs> welcome viewers. I'm Lawrence Yang, as you know. Welcome to the FTS in the Zoom podcast. We have um, some amazing guests with us today. First, we have Natalie Marchnek, who you've I think, wait, have, yes, you've met before. We did the episode in the Fonda way back. When, yeah, in the car, yeah. In the car about two, two years, three years ago. The wow, beginning right before the of the, it was like the beginning of pandemic time. Oh, wow. Feb 2020. So I refer to Natalie as a, a, a coach, a trainer, um, a doctor, a PhD researcher, and mother, intuitive, healer. What are some of the other terms that you like to, to describe yourself, Natalie? Wow, thank you. Uh, a narcissism hacker. That's the main term that I use to describe myself, to encapsulate a number of different activities like activism, subtle anarchy, uh, disruptor, uh, educator, facilitator of change, facilitator of a process so those are and and unlearning or undoing or dismantling so yeah well i i think did you say subtle anarchist or, or, subtle yeah. anarchist yeah <laughs> yeah i love it <laughs> you love it you know? and uh we met on on twitter of course uh i think it was 2018 and we met on twitter and it's 2023 now so we've hit past our five-year anniversary of our my learning journey with you and it's just been amazing our learning journey together Lawrence. <laughs> you're too kind um and we have iram iram yunus you are a family physician we met in a leadership and mm. management program together uh running yes. under the auspices of the simon fraser university in british columbia we had a fantastic facilitator trainer mm -hmm. there named kate dilworth mm -hmm. shout out to kate um i just saw you had a Coned kitty. <laughs> yes, that is my cat who recently got neutered yesterday and um, is just uh, a little bit um, wanting a little bit of affection, basically. But yes, as you mentioned, I am a family physician. I um, previously had my own practice and then officially transitioned over to being a full time hospitalist. Mm, yeah. And we've been chatting a lot since uh, since then. You know, we had a social group chat. Uh, on, on WhatsApp with our other classmates. And you and I have, have uh, crossed paths a lot of times in various like medical leadership and quality improvement spaces. And you, you came about a, a topic that you're really fascinated by. And then you messaged me about it somehow, asking me about it. And then I said, I know who you got to speak to. And that's <laughs> Natalie. So introduce the topic to us. Iram, what, what are you interested to, to explore today on the FTS and the Zoom podcast? So today we're hoping to talk about narcissistic personality disorder. And this is something that I have been recently reading quite a bit about, especially as I try to learn and increase my awareness of mental health and um, the stigma associated with mental illnesses. So one of the first questions that I have um, if you wouldn't mind just defining what narcissistic personality disorder is and actually what personality disorders are in general for the lay person who might be viewing this um, uh, for the first time. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, question because um, I don't talk about narcissism in a clinical way. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I don't refer to narcissistic personality disorder, I'm not dismissing its validity, but I tend to see these labels as quite dehumanizing mm -hmm. and normalized in our society, especially within medical practice, to label people as having faulty personality rather than acknowledging the developmental perspective, the developmental lens of all of our, you know, um, you know, human development and what shapes personality and what might be happening in a family context and community context that is shaping somebody's way of existing to bring out certain narcissistic traits mm -hmm. and why. 
So that's more of my interest rather than zoning in on a on a kind of label to define a number of features of a person without mm -hmm. looking at the historical origin and the developmental story. So that's a little disappointing response. No, 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 no. That, that was actually great because that ties into um, a question that I had because it sounds like you're 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 of the mindset these that these are traits these are not fixed entities that define a person potentially for the rest of their lives with mm. the associated stigma and so i'm curious as to what kinds of traits you see as being narcissistic just as an opener yeah so let's define what narcissistic is and we could bring in narcissistic personality disorder within that framing so narcissism tends to be thought of as uh, uh, features of ourselves where we center ourselves all the time, where uh, you know we have a sense of entitlement to have certain things or be certain things, um, uh, that our self-image is really important, um, that we are self-important, we are better than a lot of people or most people, we know better. Um, so these are some of the ideas around narcissism, just so occupied with oneself and one's internal uh, processes. And it's about me, my way, and um, like that. And I, I extend it a little more um, to incorporate ideas about control and power, because ultimately, why would we be doing these things? It's not because I just need everyone to love me all the time and pay me lots of attention attention is a for this like addiction to attention or addiction to having my needs met by everyone else all the time and feeling entitled to it is an addiction mm -hmm. and and it's an addiction it's a form of greed i need to have all these things i need to either have a huge following or huge influence or um you know get all the attention and get all the all the things so it's like a uh greed it's a resource acquisition and maintenance and growth so it is about power but it's also about control controlling how you see me mm -hmm. controlling what you think about me controlling mm -hmm. how others see me and think about me and when you don't think about me in the way that i want i'm going to get pissed off and i'm i'm going to use that as a justification for blaming you shaming you hurting you harming you mm -hmm. and all the sorts of behaviors to in order for me to preserve this sense of identity or image where mm -hmm. I feel comfortable all the time in that state because I'm in control and I'm in control of other people's behaviors too. So it's not just about us as just being in control of our lives. It goes, extends into, I need to control other people in order, and that's a form of you know power abuse or misuse. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing so, I'm also gaining power because I need to ascend in some mm -hmm. way uh, according to a social hierarchy or family hierarchy, uh, mm -hmm. for me to have this power, for me to be able to have this level of control. Mm -hmm. So you could see how these tra traits can play out in any of us, depending mm -hmm. on the context that we're in, that require us to play up these traits in order to succeed mm -hmm. and survive, really, mm -hmm. survive and succeed. So that is, these are, I just labeled, I guess, describe narcissism and narcissistic traits i didn't go into any details about what did these traits look like we'll get there i guess um and so narcissistic personality disorder um which is falls under you know a category of mental health condition or mental illness um it's just that a person believes they're better than anyone else and it justifies all the behaviors that reinforce it um so they're entitled and that can go into other realms of dark triad personality traits where they're sadistic you know, Machiavellian, um, mm. psychopathic, um, where, you know, there's pleasure in uh, harming others. There's a load of, like, there's no empathy at all. There's mm. no consideration or regard for the impact you might have on anyone else. It's all about me, my way and preserving my comfort. And if you make me uncomfortable so that I feel shamed or inferior or inadequate, I will make you pay. So, or I will make you wrong so that I can be right and maintain a sense of superiority. Mm -hmm. So that's a, yeah, that's an overarching description of narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder within that. Thank you, that was great actually. Lawrence, you wanna take the next one? 
Yeah, I actually had some curiosity questions that came up. Um, what what drew you, um, Iram, to to this topic? Like, what what made it so that you were, became so curious about this? So, you know, kind of going back, um, I've had lived experience, both myself as well as family members, suffering great a great deal from various mental illnesses, and I've often wondered about personality disorders because they were exhibiting certain traits. Um, so I, I, and then of course I started thinking about my own, the relationships in my life, the friendships that I have and sort of trying to, I guess, in a way, label behaviors, problematic behaviors. And that's how I stumbled upon, uh, narcissistic personality disorder and then the different types of narcissisms. Um, and then of course I've heard, I read about the dark triad as well, which, uh, Natalie, that you alluded to. And so in, in my reading, I basically then started wondering to myself, how do I know if I'm a narcissist? <laughs> yeah, how do I know if I have it? How do I know if I have the, have the nursey? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, sometimes I wonder, like, I'm doing this podcasting thing, so, like, so much of it is about recording me having these conversations, like, this is there is some narcissism in this, you know, that trying to create this legacy online of of conversations. So I'm like, do I have the narcy as well? You know, so, <laughs> the I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um yeah. Thoughts thoughts on that, Natalie? Um uh yeah, uh, I think similar pathway. You have experiences in your life that make you that challenge your thinking and and make you curious about what motivates certain behaviors, especially when you think you're feeling you're being rational or reasonable and you expect that same response back from others who you also assumed were responsible and reasonable for a number of reasons, like they're educated, for example. And then you find out, no, not so much because I'm trying to be assertive. I'm trying to, you know, create a situation where we can work together to work through something, but this other person resorts to, behaviors where I'm constantly blamed or shamed and they never take accountability. So I'm going to have a hard time maintaining a relationship with that person because as long as uh, I want my needs met and they require me to meet their needs at all times, we have very different expectations about this relationship. So it's not going to last. So what I'm hearing is that one of the telltale signs that we're dealing with narcissism is that there's absolutely a power differential and so much of the narcissism is, is, is a power gradient kind of asserted onto us into the into the relational milieus such that we are at a disadvantage continuously there's no mm -hmm. there's no there's no equity is, is that a fair yeah yeah um so again every we talk about narcissistic personality disorder or narcissism there's a tendency to individualize it go i'm being narcissistic or i'm a narcissist or they're the narcissist instead of understanding these things only come out in relationships. They're in relationship, whether it's with, uh, you know, a group on social media, uh, like as a pro-social relationship or between you and I, or within a group, it's a relational thing. So narcissism that I talk about is interpersonal. Um, and it comes about, these traits and behaviors come about because of something that's happening in this relationship, in this moment, that's making me feel quite uncomfortable and threatened that I have to defend myself and therefore dominate the other person. Um, so we're constantly doing this dance, I think, in our any day, everyday relationships where there is, we are in this power differential, unless we have an approach that we're using in our relationship where we can talk through things and, and not feel threatened by each other. And what does that need? It needs trust. We need to be able to trust each other and respect each other and our ways of thinking and our way of, you know, doing things and not trying to change the other person, but work out how do we, how do we leverage what we do in our ways to make sense of something and to take actions that fulfill a purpose um, that benefits both of us. And so that's different than what I'm talking about is these interpersonal narcissistic traits, which is about, um, it's my way because that's what I need to feel safe. Wow. So I think you've just kind of given the motivation for someone to behave nar narcissistically because they need to feel safe. And so, so they create this power gradient mm -hmm. some, somehow. Like our third question that Irma and I had typed in WhatsApp was, how does it happen? 
Mm, <laughs> How does it yeah. happen that we that someone might start yeah. I- implementing this power gradient? Well, this is the language, right? This is the interesting thing. I'm listening to the language you're using of somebody implementing a power gradient rather than it being a feature or a symptom of two people coming together, contributing to the development of a power Ooh. gradient. Okay. There's an assumption that someone has more power to do it. It's it's more reasonable to to understand that we are both contributing to something. It's just that we're not talking about it. it none of it's explicit, um, and it just turns out that there's a there's a hierarchy. Uh, Natalie, that's an interesting point that you made. But I'm I'm curious. Is that really fair to say though? Because oftentimes, you know, quote unquote, the victims of narcissistic folks often end up being fairly, you know, well-meaning people, kind people who just don't, you know, it blindsides them to be treated this way and, and to basically Absolutely. find that their power has been taken away and now they don't know what to do about it. You know, certainly as somebody who, um, you know, grew up in a family where I had family members that exhibited signs mm-hmm. of narcissistic personality disorder and the, uh, huge impact that it had on me growing up and how I had to really work hard to counter the negative harms from that, you know, it it would be really, I I don't know if I would be, it would be fair for, you know, for me to say that I had power in ever, ever in that situation, especially as a child. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we need to think about situations and context when we're talking about the subject. Because if we're thinking about children and parents and power abuse of parent with child, the child is fully dependent. They're not an autonomous, you know, individual who can go off in the world and and create their own life. Mm -hmm. They are fully dependent on the parent. And a parent has to be responsive and attuned to the child's needs. And Mm -hmm. depending on, you know, what's gone on for the parent, they will respond in a way that is either nurturing or not. And that is what shapes, you know, the the way a child responds to other authorities as they as they grow up. So definitely the child doesn't co-create that relationship. But as adults or people who are living beyond, you know, we're living semi-independently or independently as adults, as you and I, there's a, that's a different story. Mm. And I'm and I'm also not suggesting that uh, you know if somebody abused me and like you know were violent towards me or hurt me that somehow I had a part to play in that. That's mm-hmm. not the the language I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. It's understanding there's a beginning of a relationship and mm-hmm. that beginning shapes how it proceeds. So we need to start going questioning, going again back to the history, the source. When this relationship started, what was going on in that beginning that actually predicted? this outcome later on. I see. I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's actually quite empowering the way that you frame it, because that means each of us has the ability to identify problematic traits and behaviors and then choose to either walk away or choose to call it out and change the narrative of that relationship moving forward. Would that be fair Mm -hmm. to say? Yeah. Well, change the narrative of the relationship um, again, depends depends on the, the situation we're talking about, because yeah. I, I yeah, what what is the narrative that we're dealing with? Because the, the narrative is I was victimized by this person, or I was the perpetrator of abuse in this relationship, or we, you know, that's often what you hear. Like I was abused. You hear all you see so many things online about how to spot the narcissist, and then I wonder. How interesting that everyone else is a narcissist, but none of the people searching for this information would be narcissistic. They're always the victim. So what is the lens that we're using to understand our mm-hmm. our role and our contribution to what unfolded in a, in a relationship? Fair enough. But again, you- it's not condoning abuse of power. It's recognizing that any of us can be abusive with our power. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious as to whether you feel that narcissism has been rising over the decades and whether you find that it seems to be more common in developed countries versus developing countries. Mm-hmm. So if we think about interpersonal narcissism as part of like a hierarchy or dominance based hierarchical relationship not a mutual relationship. So you think about families, families are often structured that way where there's a parent um, 
who is like the overseeing person authority in the family, even though there might be two parents or two caregivers or several caregivers, tends to be one dominant one setting the scene and everyone falls into line in this particular social order to kind of preserve the hierarchy. Everyone has a role. So um, so if you're in, you know, one part of the world, if I think about, I've spent time in India. So there's a particular way that mm -hmm. uh, family life looks or in, you know, Middle Eastern countries is a very specific mm -hmm. patriarchal or, you know, uh, way of being in a family that's just part of the culture, which mm -hmm. you would see differently in, mm -hmm. you know, Canada, or Australia, or, you know, mm -hmm. the US, or the mm -hmm. UK, for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's neither good, bad, or whatever, it's what happens mm -hmm. within that hierarchical structure that mm -hmm. um, makes the difference. So have we seen more narcissism? I think we've seen over time, a, in, let's just think about North America, um, an increase in uh, centering one's feelings and emotional state and comfort and, and needing to be comfortable and feel safe and, you know, be seen in a certain way. And I think that has increased over time. Like that's more prevalent now as I see it and everyone's online and talking about their feelings and talking about this. And it's all about me, me, me <laughs> and what I'm going through and mm -hmm. less like that. And maybe it's also because, of the generations, if you think about immigrants who came from other countries and, you know, immigrant immigrated to, you know, Canada, Australia, mm -hmm. UK, they didn't have time for that sort of thing had to get on with life, <laughs> make yeah. stuff happen. Yes. <laughs> um, and then the generations that emerge from that, they have mm -hmm. a little more comfort. They don't have to necessarily have that um, survival attitude because there's a certain foundation. And again, I'm generalizing. Mm -hmm. but it gives people more space to do whatever with their time and uh, be a little bit um, innovative with how they, you know, do work, for example, um, and becoming an influencer or becoming an entrepreneur and, and mm -hmm. having to promote yourself and having to follow mm -hmm. certain rules to support the algorithms that will get you visible and will get more mm -hmm. likely to get clients and conversions and, and that sort of thing. So our incentives for being online and relating with others might have changed and that might have made us more narcissistic but again we're <laughs> it's a big question and i think more people are able to interact with more people because of the world we live in now versus 20 years ago or 30 years ago so we're gonna see more of it mm -hmm. of course thank you uh, our next question was based on the I think um, Iram has been studying things like cognitive behavioral therapy, studying a lot of mental health stuff uh, and like the specific diagnostic stuff. And our medical culture, as you probably know, Natalie, we're so protective about our words, about our diagnoses and our terms and our definitions. Mm -hmm. So of course the narcissistic personality disorder is different mm -hmm. from the more would you call it the more colloquial use of the, the, the term? Or how, what's the proper language for the narcissism hacking that you were talking about? You're talking, uh, Natalie, you're talking about, what's the, what's the is it colloquial? Or how, how would you not? Well, lots of people call people narcissists, yeah. you know? So they're not necessarily people with an officially assessed and diagnosed with NPD by a, you know, professional. I would, um, yeah, I would say the number of the times used in, in that context of the person's <laughs> narcissist is probably tens of mm. orders of like, uh, yeah, logarithmically in, mm. uh, higher than the actual diagnosed. Yeah. So, so that if that's the more common, that ought to have potentially more power. Is it okay <laughs> if I bring up the definition just so that it might guide a little bit of our of conversation going forward? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. And I just Googled it while you guys were talking. Mm -hmm. And here it is. I, this is Mayo Clinic. It says narcissistic personality disorder is a mental health condition in which people have an unreasonable high sense of their own importance. They need and seek too much attention and want people to admire them. 
People with this disorder may lack the ability to understand or care about the feelings of others. But behind this mask of extreme confidence, they are not sure of their own self-worth and are easily upset by the slightest criticism. Hmm. Yep. That almost seems in line with some of the the uh, social use usage of this word that I that I've uh, that I've encountered in my mm -hmm, mm -hmm. experience. Yeah, it, it's almost so. It, we actually might actually be talking about the same thing. Um, it's just that, like, I actually have not seen any psychiatrist consultant report come back to me saying your patient likely has a diagnosis of such and such. Have you seen anything like that? You know? No, no, oh. I've never seen narcissistic traits or narcissistic personality disorder diagnosed. I've seen antisocial and borderline, um, mm. but definitely not narcissistic ever. Yeah, and you pro you have at least seven, eight years of, I mean, since medical school, probably 10 years that you've yeah. been studying and, and encountering patients. I have about 20 years. So mm. in our 30 years combined, we've not seen one case of narcissistic mm. personality disorder. So that says something. It says that this entity, narcissistic personality disorder exists probably mostly in the colloquial use of it. Uh, and I, there's probably a lot of resonance in, in what Natalie has said that, that it fits exactly with what Mayo Clinic has said. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, how many people would actually go and get a dog? How many people who are narcissists are high up on the narcissism spectrum um uh would go yeah i'm a narcissist and i need help with this i need to go get myself <laughs> assessed and diagnosed you know it's often a they family will. member um getting a child or getting like an adult child or mm. spouse or, or somebody in their family to go have a look um yeah, yeah. And a lot of things get picked up as borderline personality disorder. But there's lots of traits that overlap. And um, yeah, the, and these are traits within all of us. That's, that's mm -hmm. the truth. Like it's just there. Um, mm -hmm. It's just our ability to regulate ourselves. Our emotional regulation capacity or competence is what will um, kind of cause us to restrain from or not needing to respond to situations where we feel a bit uncomfortable um, in a controlling way. Like, you know, just reading the definition of NPD, like you did just now, Lawrence, I was thinking about medical trainees who are receiving feedback from, you know, a superior because of the toxic way that it happens. Of course, they're going to feel triggered and feel crap about themselves. It's not because the criticism is accurate. It's, but they're, you're going to be sensitive to it because you've probably experienced it enough times to know that it feels like crap that you're already on guard and feeling threatened even before the guy opens or woman or whoever opens their mouth. Mm -hmm. Does that make you a narcissist? No. We have to understand what causes someone to start to feel threatened by information mm -hmm. that their ego can't handle it. What would have happened in their life up until that point that made it difficult for them to um, just be difficult to not be impacted by somebody else's words so well, natalie sorry. Uh, sorry lawrence do you want to no, no you go ahead yeah. so i'm curious you know you mentioned that narcissism is a spectrum and i and i agree you know um certainly in speaking with counselors previously i've learned that uh we all have some degree of narcissism and so my question for you is at what point do you think it becomes problematic such that it warrants intervention? Uh, I guess you have to define what problematic is and then also define what you mean by intervention and who, who's intervening. I guess the context matters because if this is in the workplace, then it's the manager mm -hmm. potentially who's gonna be intervening. Um, what if the manager is the problem? <laughs> and the person demonstrating some of these traits actually self-defensive because the manager is threatening. That's so whose lens are we looking at? You know, there's, it's complex, you know, yeah. and I know everyone wants a black and white answer, yeah. but we have to look at things from a contextual and nuanced way to appreciate this is a relational thing. So mm -hmm. if someone's acting a certain way, someone else is going to have a response to that. And mm -hmm. 
if it happens in a consistent, if these responses and these interactions happen in a consistent way, then you could start to di do an analysis and diagnose what's actually going on. Who's the dominant one in this situation? Mm -hmm. And who's the one who's constantly feeling victimized or actually being victimized because someone is using their power in a way to coerce someone to do what they need in a way that's actually harmful for that person. So how would you tease apart that dynamic? Because I I'm guessing this is what you do in your work where you go into potentially problematic workplaces and you're trying to figure out those power differentials and those potentially problematic relationships. So how do you, how would you tease that out? What's your process? <laughs> well, again, a workplace is, I talk about narcissism as interpersonal in a workplace though, there's more than two people often, um, you know, the, the person who comes to me, they're having an issue with someone else. So we hear about those, the two, but then there's also the others who are part of this family system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we need to find out what all the roles that are being played and how are they contributing and influencing what is happening between these two people? Mm -hmm. What are the other relationships that we need to be alert to that are um, not helping or which are the ones that are supportive um, of the person who is feeling affected by um, another person's behavior toward them and wanting some help. Um, so there are, again, telltale signs of somebody who is the, the problematic person, whether it's a manager, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member. Um, and it goes back to, does that person feel entitled to having their needs met all the time? And then they react every time they hear something from you that makes them uncomfortable or they don't want to hear it. And they're not able to receive that feedback graciously or curiously. Um, and they end up defend being defensive and blaming and shaming like when somebody's blaming and shaming all the time that lets you know there's no way this person's ever going to want to take accountability for any of their actions mm -hmm. they just want to deflect and make everyone else wrong so they maintain their sense of superiority or rightness because their ego is being bruised and they can't handle it um, so they're going to blame and shame, be defensive, they'll gaslight, they'll deny accusations, they'll, re you know, re they'll do the DARVO, deny accusation, reversing victim and offender so that they're never wrong. It's always on you to fix things. Mm. It's, it's always on you. You should sacrifice yourself for me. You should submit to me. Um, th there's that. So that's the more dominant, obvious version. There's a flip side. This is there's the covert and what's known as the, mm -hmm. the vulnerable narcissistic traits. We're talking yeah. about the spectrum now. Mm -hmm. So there's a way for someone to maintain control and dominance, but using very different features. Mm -hmm. So they come across as um, quite gentle or vulnerable or soft spoken or really touchy feely, lovey dovey, friendly, safe. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who feel called to you know at, attracted or have an affinity to that person are tend to be the ones who are the nurturers the saviors the fixers because there's something about that person's vulnerability that kind of speaks to the heart of that savior person yeah. uh, and makes them want to like look after them and protect them and nurture them so mm -hmm. And that person, you, the, the the more vulnerable narcissistic or covert narcissistic person uses those their own you know weakness to always have a bad day and they always have to have a worse day than anyone else so if you're in a you're a friend with them you're their friend and you're having a bad day after, and you've spent all this you know times with that person making them feel good and reassuring them and supporting them then it, when it's your turn to have a bad day oh no they're how dare you take the attention away from them <laughs> they're going to have a worse day than you they're going to find something to yeah. make make it seem like uh like then they're they're more of the victim than you are and you should be grateful for what you have and how dare you um take away the spotlight from their from their suffering i am you feel like crap you'll come away from that interaction feeling ashamed and guilty but that's part of the manipulation this really resonates natalie <laughs> <It's gonna be laughs> <tills>, actually <laughs> um which is sad and I definitely feel I sad know. <laughs> and this is the hardest thing for people to understand because we assume people with certain levels of education credentials upbringing to be reasonable and rational people 
Mm-hmm. And that they wouldn't act this way. That's the cog- That's our problem. That's our issue. Assuming that education equals emotional regulation, mm-hmm. but and that that therefore they're not doing it, in, and they're not doing it intentionally. Therefore, we should just give them grace and forgive them. Mm-hmm. But just because they're not doing it intentionally, because they're not like psychopaths, mm-hmm. makes it harder because they're unaware of what they're doing. And every time you try to make them aware they don't want to hear it. So they're going to remain unconscious to it and therefore never have accountability. That's true. So it makes it more difficult and more frustrating because Mm -hmm. it's unintentional, because it's unconscious and because there's no desire from their end, there's no incentive for them to make, to do anything differently because so far the way that they've been behaving has served them just fine. And if you don't want to serve them in the way they need it, they're going to find someone else to do that for them. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. I, I, you know, and through my experience and reading through all, all of this literature about narcissism, the one key thing that I kind of pulled away was the way that you might be able to tell, especially a covert narcissist, apart from just a regular, vulnerable, decent person is how (laughs) secure they are. Um, You know, just just, if they seem like they're secure with who they are, they know who they are, they know what their values are and they're consistent, Mm -hmm. that person is more likely to be genuine, authentic, as opposed to like a covert narcissist. And that's just kind of the sense that I've gotten from my readings. And I'm curious as to what your take on that is. Yeah. So, I mean, I've written a piece basically about what is narcissism? What are the, you know, features of the narcissism spectrum? What are the different narcissistic behaviors? And Mm -hmm. what is, what narcissism is not? And it's like what you said, feeling confident to express yourself without needing to seek validation. You're not there for other people. You don't really care too much about whether people are not like you, uh, Mm -hmm. like you or not, but you're also not trying to push people's buttons because you're being defiant and rebellious. You're just confident and your self-worth is intact. You know who you are, you know what your values are, you know what your principles are, and you're doing what you, you know, navigating this life to try to live into them as best Mm -hmm. as you can. You have humility, which doesn't mean you're hoity-toity. It means you know stuff, but you're also aware that there's stuff you don't know and that you can learn from others, regardless of credentials and, you know, what have you. Um, Mm -hmm. There's always something to learn. There's self-restraint that I have a way of regulating myself, that if I'm feeling a certain way or want to say something, but I know that what I'm going to say is going to have a really negative impact on that person, then I'm Mm -hmm. able to hold myself back. Because mm-hmm. someone who is not narcissistic considers the impact of their actions on other people, mm-hmm. but they don't go overboard to try to work, not disappoint people or not make people upset. Mm-hmm. Sometimes upset is part of, that's how we need to learn. We're not going to like what we hear about ourselves all the time, but I don't have to do it intentionally as a weapon to hurt you mm-hmm. because I'm, I'm here to support you and, you know, in this together. Um there's a tolerance to discomfort. So if I hear something that I don't like or about, or I find out something about myself from feedback from someone else, yes, I'm going to feel uncomfortable, but I'm not going to make them wrong and make them feel like crap from telling me something that I didn't want to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll sting and I'll tell it, it sting. That really hurts, but I know you're not hurting me and I'm mm-hmm. going to work through this. Um, mm-hmm. Or I feel shame and I'm not going to you know, unleash my anger about my shame on someone else as if they're at fault for the feeling I'm having inside. I'm going to just sit with it. Mm -hmm. So I have a tolerance to discomfort. I don't try to act and do anything about it. I can sit with it momentarily and acknowledge that it's there. And I have emotional maturity and regulation. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeking people to meet my emotional needs. I'm able to manage myself doesn't mean I don't ask for help doesn't mean you know I'm totally self-reliant and I don't need anyone that's an that's this kind of hyper individualism that's also problematic it's Mm -hmm. I just don't need people to caretake me when I'm having feelings (laughs) and I'm if I'm feeling something I'm not going to be reactive I can kind of regulate myself or acknowledge that I might be having a tough time and maybe call on support to help me regulate but I'm not going to need someone to make me feel good about myself all the time and have Mm -hmm. that dependency and that there's an interdependence that, you know, there's a reciprocity in my relationships, that there's mutual trust and regard that Mm -hmm. we're here for each other. We have different skills, knowledge, expertise, lived experiences, and we can just be with each other in our differences and our similarities. And um, we support each other. 
rather than one person using the other to meet their needs and the other person has to sacrifice for that person. So it's a give and receive relationship versus the narcissistic dynamic, which is a, someone gives and the other takes and it's not mutual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a great answer and really clarified things for me. I appreciate that. Mm. Great. Oh, Lawrence, you're on mute. Something sticks out to me, uh, Natalie, thank you, that uh, you had said that the the narcissist generates this power gradient because it serves them in this relational context. Mm -hmm. And I, I was drawn to this part of the definition. I'm going to bring it back up on screen. It was this portion at the bottom that says, but behind this mask of extreme confidence, they are not sure of their self-worth and are easily upset by the slightest criticism. Mm -hmm. It's rare that I see something in medical text, like I assume this is, Mayo Clinic would only put this here if there's some uh, text behind it. It's rare that I, I see the motivations behind a particular disorder, and this one actually says it's because they're unsure, they're feeling, as you said, Natalie, feeling unsafe in their context, and then suddenly they create this power gradient, and they try to mm. bring this power gradient cloud with them to every relationship they're in and then they try to find the people who will fit into their dark cloud <laughs> oh wow yeah really yeah mm. yeah um so i see it as two things like why would i not feel confident i'm holding it's because i'm holding a lot of i'm feeling shame there's things about me that are unlovable unlikable uh untouchable i'm i've got this you know, stain on me that I can't get rid of. So there's something bad about me. Um, I have no value. I'm not, you know, regardless of all the great stuff that's going on and all my accomplishments, there's still a part of me that believes that I'm shit basically. And so um, I'm going to do all these things to cover it up and maintain a facade of fabulousness um, or maintain a facade of extreme vulnerability and weakness that Either way, I'm going to be attracting resources to take care of me. Um, and the other part of it is, why would I not feel safe? Why would I constant, like, why would I react when I'm feeling uncertain? And um, that's because I don't trust. Because in my life, I've experienced a number of betrayals, even before I had cognition. That has led me to experience the world as unsafe and untrustworthy. And those betrayals have never been repaired. So by the authority who betrayed me or the authorities or the, the things that happened that created this rift between the reality that I have and the reality that I want. So Natalie, um, just to kind of piggyback onto off of what you were saying, um, I'm curious as to what you think leads one person to respond to those betrayals of trust and these very difficult circumstances growing up what you know force or basically makes one person decide to go the narcissistic route versus you know like the people pleasing route you know when you think about for instance trauma responses and that sort of behavior um what i guess factors about the person or other factors do you think kind of push somebody into the narcissistic direction as opposed to another direction yeah, it's an interesting question because I see people pleasing as also narcissistic. It's very much for the self. Yeah. It's not for the other. It's for my own safety. It's for my own survival. I'm doing it for me, but I'm making you think that I'm there for you. Interesting. Okay. So none of those in my mind are different. They're just different ways that narcissism expresses itself in order for me to keep myself safe and survive in this uncertain, unpredictable, unstable environment that I'm in. Okay. What do you then what? think about pathological altruism? And, you know, and the reason why I ask that is because I was reading deeply into people pleasing as, you know, I was trying to figure out uh, like how, how the concept of self-love and people pleasing, you know, relate and, and how people who are religious or spiritual oftentimes will be seen as people pleasers, but they're the ones that have the idea of delayed gratification. You know, what goes around comes around, God will reward you in the afterlife, that sort of thing. But then I came across this concept of pathological altruism. 
And that just blew my mind. <laughs> um, and so I'm curious as to how you think pathological altruism relates to narcissism. Like, do you think the two are related, given that now you've said that people pleasing is a form of narcissism? Yeah, if you think about, you know, I'm um, doing things for the benefit of my afterlife or what goes around comes around. These are all things about me and me, me needing to be rewarded in some way. So I'm going to be motivated to do things for that reward. I'm not doing it because of some higher purpose, but I can use a religious framework to justify it. So there's, yeah, yeah. So it really calls on us to think about our ethics, you know, like what, who am I doing this for? And can I feel good about myself if I don't do these things in these prescribed ways, but I'm doing them motivated from a place of, I know what's right for me to do here to be there for someone. And I'm not looking for a reward or even recognition or a specialness factor. I'm doing it because mm -hmm. it's what's right for me and what is appropriate in this context with that person. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to feel good about myself because I'm, I'm living in line with my values, not mm -hmm. because I'm getting some sort of ex reward from some external authority, mm -hmm. whether it's God or another person or an institution. Mm -hmm. But is it um, reasonable to, I guess, you know, as a person who is trying to do good in the world, is it reasonable to expect that person to never have any expectations of other people being similarly good and kind to them? Nice to have those expectations. Nice to believe that, you know, people could do that for us. But if we hold, if we expect that those expectations are going to be met all the time, we're we're going to feel frustrated. Yeah. Um, so I tend to think of if I'm having a repeated interaction with someone, I'm going to learn more about them and that will shape what is reasonable to expect from them. Mm -hmm. And what is even better if I'm developing an, a sustainable relationship, then we we're quite explicit about what we can expect from each other in order to preserve the relationship. Mm -hmm. But if I'm just going to assume that you're going to treat me well, because I'm, I think I'm treating you well, there's a lot of assumptions, but no, no actual agreements that are being made, just social contracts, but they're not, <laughs> I didn't sign anything. They didn't sign anything, but they come from how we're influenced to, so, you know, our socialization and what we, what we're shown as acceptable and permissible. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. So, you know, you can think of what I'm talking about as a like cynical lens to relationships, but I kind of have learned that people need to earn their trust, my trust of them, just as mm. I have to earn other people's trust and I shouldn't just get it because mm -hmm. of a credential or because I'm nice to them that one day. Um, there's a certain behaviors that require consistency for someone to go, all right, Nat, I feel really safe with you because you've been consistent and stable, regardless of whatever I'm going through, I could see that you're stable. Mm -hmm. And that's enough for me to trust you. But we're often too easy to fall for certain behaviors and mistake them as trustworthy and trust that person right away, only to find out it was not the right choice. And sometimes we find out it is the right choice. But mm -hmm. when we're playing these kind of gambles without mm -hmm. having a process to like thinking about trust mm -hmm. and trustworthiness, um, we're going to be learning through trial and error versus mm -hmm. applying what we've learned from trial and error into the way we form relationships. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> and pathological altruism, just to make sure that I understand what you mean by it. Do you want to define it? So uh, in my readings, it was the idea of um, altruism essentially taken too far. So for instance, thinking that you're doing good despite the means. So, you know, for instance, a mother writing her son's essay, she is trying to, you know, essentially protect the child, um, but she's going about it the wrong way. Or even, you know, the article that I read actually took it as far as the 9-11 bombers, like they thought they were doing the right thing, but that's pathological altruism at its extremist. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's just this idea, I guess, that the um, ends justify the means sort of mm. thing. And that's where it becomes problematic. And so that yeah. to me was just, you know, a real eye opener. <laughs>
because I've all, always considered myself as an altruistic person, mm. you know, who goes above and beyond. And then I had to, you know, pause and think to myself, well, wait a minute, why am I actually doing it? Yeah. And how could this be harmful, not just to myself, but potentially to the person I'm trying to help? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so I would call that narcissistic because we've entered into savior mode. Mm -hmm. I know best, I know what's best for that person, or I don't want that person to suffer the consequences of their own actions. So I'm going to protect them, but it's just going to blow up in our faces. Like it just, that's what's going to happen because you can, you have to then preserve that. Mm -hmm. If you do it once, you're going to have to do it again and again and again, because if you establish a precedent with that other person or with mm -hmm. that group and if that becomes part of your self-worth and your identity, you can't just not do it you're going to keep feeling compelled to do it. So if you go above and beyond once and everyone praises you for it and now there's expectations, you've, just, you've raised the bar of expectations, have made it harder for yourself to have a really, sh you know, a bad day where you can't live up to that standard. And then you feel crap about yourself, even though the standard that you are still performing is awesome. It's just not at that unrealistic level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're no longer catering to the ex external expectations. And we've abandoned our own back again to our values and principles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in favor of pleasing some external authority. I see. And so this is what we're socialized in from uh -huh. birth. <laughs> and it's reinforced in our education system and mm -hmm. super reinforced in medical training. Mm -hmm. That's so by true. the time you get into practice, you're a bit, you know, I would imagine your expectations of what you should be able to do for someone else is already skewed and completely unrealistic. And it makes it harder for you to actually connect with that person who's mm -hmm. coming to you and to hear what they, you know, to listen out for what their needs and priorities are mm -hmm. and just meet them there because mm -hmm. there's all this other ritual and song and dance that you have to do because of the expectations um, that mm -hmm. you've been indoctrinated <laughs> to believing make you a good doctor. We went to rescuer and savior school, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what we went to rescue yeah. i was just about to say you know natalie based on that last bit that you just said i feel like <laughs> i'm a narcissist now no no what do i do about no it? nobody's a narcissist <laughs> stop it stop but these are narcissistic traits again where we feel mm -hmm. we're important and it causes us to dominate and become overpowering you know we overpower someone else's way mm -hmm. and it's coming from a good place mm -hmm. um but if we are constantly assuming we're doing the right thing and never actually examining our actions and the actual impact it's having, then we become uh, victims to our own delusion versus mm -hmm. I need to see, is this practice that I'm doing mm -hmm. having the impact that I expected to have or mm -hmm. the outcome that I'm seeking? Mm -hmm. And if I don't ask those questions, if I don't reflect on my practice in that way, I'm never going to know. And I'm just going to keep preserving this uh you know image of myself i had a discussion with uh dr tom tom wright he's a, a doctor from the uk who's moved to Kelowna, uh british columbia about three years ago and he was saying that in our system we we give so much unsolicited advice we drop so much information and prescriptions on a table for yeah. people who didn't ask us for that so we're, we're living out this delusion that people need what we have. Mm. We haven't taken the time to actually figure out what people really want. And what you've described there is there's this delusion that mm. Western medicine has everything that everybody yeah. needs. Yeah. Mm. And here's the other thing. So here's the next bit that you're in this relationship with a patient, but who knows the patient's context and their symptoms and everything best? Is it the doctor or is it the patient? It's the patient. Yeah. There's stuff that the doctors can learn about how a patient understands their experience and how they're using their resources to live their life, even if it's a way that goes against evidence or best practice, mm -hmm. but they're living their way and we can learn to appreciate and value what it is that they're doing. And maybe I'm going to learn something that I'll be, that'll be useful to, to bring that lens into my next consults. Mm -hmm. But doctor knows best because everything we learn we got from you know medical training and that equips us mm -hmm. is the end of our learning <laughs> is the end of learning <laughs> versus what I can learn from my patients where there's this kind of mutual 
and patients don't come thinking that they're going to teach their doctors anything mm -hmm. but when it, when it, what would it be like if that were the case where patients felt like they were partners and they were getting support that was appropriate for them based on their needs and priorities and the doctor's role was to help them pick apart their stories so that their needs and priorities surface Mm -hmm. as well as the whole picture of what's going on in that person's life and what's influencing the manifestation of these symptoms. I would say that's the beauty of family medicine because that's exactly what community family doctors do. Yeah, exactly. they do it really well. <laughs> some, of, some of us definitely do it very well. Um, <laughs> but some of us, I feel like a lot of historical medical culture is we went to, we went to narcissism school. Yeah. <laughs> we, we went to we went to learn everything we need to know and that nobody else is right and we have all the answers School. yeah mm. and then when patients started googling that became a threat and how mm. dare they access information that we didn't give them <laughs> you're making us feel useless <laughs> yeah it's interesting it's interesting so the uh pathological altruism you know there's the intent behind what we're doing but people don't feel the intent they feel the impact of the action and that's what we need to be thinking about what I think effect that's am really I having powerful on statement. that's a really powerful statement thank you natalie hmm. i want to yeah. bring us back there are some um almost didactic components that i i think we're, we're really rushed over you mentioned something called the dark triad, you know, what, what is that? Uh, it might actually be best if uh, Natalie spoke to that, because I I, I kind of only really know the terms, which is Machiavellianism it. and um, psychopathy. And there's a third one that I forget. Narcissist. That's oh, the yes, third there we one. go. <laughs> but there's also, there's actually more that have been added. So it's not just the triad, there's a tetrad. So sadism, sadist mm -hmm. is on that. Oh, wow. um, and then there's another new thing that came in called the dark empath. What is that? The dark empath. Oh. It's like the evil empath. <laughs> really sinister. I'm scared. Well, we, yeah. we they're all danger. they're all sinister. Yeah, be 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 afraid. Be very afraid. Um again, so you know, I don't go into characterization of personalities, but they're basically, you know, no empathy. Uh I see all of those fueled by vengeance and a justification of causing harm to others. And some derive pleasure from the harm and some believe they're not harming and they're doing some sort of favor because they're healing or some, you know, some, some distorted narrative. Um, whereas the traits that I've been referring to as narcissism are largely unconscious and not necessarily intentional and are not intended to cause harm. Although those, those behaviors can cause harm with the dark triad it's like they're conscious and they're intended to cause harm. So wow. the intention is what changes the level of mm -hmm. deliberate calculating activity. Mm -hmm. But whether they believe they're causing harm, that's again, that's part of the delusion. They might be seeing that they're like, you know, the terrorists for nine in 9-11. Like they're not path pathological altruists because their intent was to cause harm. Their intent was to, you know, destroy life. So there's nothing altruistic about it. They're well, deluding themselves into believing mm -hmm. that they're doing something good for some authority or some exactly. mission. That's what I mean, yeah. 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 But when we think about what is required for them to do that, they knew they would have to destroy life. Mm -hmm. So they're in a, these are dark triad type of things. It's deliberate, calculating, conscious planning, and it's fueled by vengeance. It's revenge. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Wow. Is the dark trance like something that one person might hold within themselves? Like, well, I think all these traits, the traits that oh. in the dark triad will, you know, they'll overlap, um, but they've been characterized into these th you know, three or four personality traits. Uh, the, the Machiavelli one, explain that to me. I, the name oh, I can't familiar. remember. It sounds, it sounds Italian. It sounds yeah. Like yeah. So it's magic. named after... Yeah. Yeah, Machiavelli uh, was a cunningness, was. apparently. Uh, yeah, cunningness, cunning. ability to be manipulative, and a drive to use whatever means necessary to gain power. 
Yeah. Oh, so like super strategist, uh, like pragmatic, uh, sly. Yeah. Playing people against each other, being yes. the puppet master of these little games. Niccolo Machiavelli, I think. Yeah. Whoa. I read his book. I read, uh, what was the book? There's a lot of Machiavellian uh, gamesmanship <laughs> in medical politics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's, but then this is the question I don't hear people asking. How do these people who are supposedly trained to be healers and helpers become like that? Mm -hmm. Were they like that at the beginning? Likely not. There's some who probably are, and it's like the perfect pathway. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and they played a part that would get them, you know, pass passing. Um, you know, the interview and all the character assessments, they just know how to act. Um, but a lot of people can become that. They have those traits already present. We all have these traits, but there's something about the context that elevates people who have certain features. I, I think as uh, those of us who have experienced significant childhood trauma, we learn to pretend really well. And we, we, that's how we, we survive and go through life. And mm. yeah, you, you learn to pretend well when, when you're doing interviews and stuff like that and mm. make it past those, everything becomes that, that game to make it past the next stage. Yeah. yeah, but there's also the features of medical education and training that are also quite toxic. And there's the hidden curriculum, which requires you to self-sacrifice. It's mm -hmm. embedded. It's seen as, you know, it's just no different to a religious institution mm -hmm. where you sacrifice, you serve God, you know, you're there to serve others, but there's nothing in there about you serving yourself and preserving yourself. You have to submit to the profession and in order to develop the ideal professional identity of you know the good doctor the effective doctor whatever there's a lot you have to give up in order to do it and that's seen as normal and almost uh noble when it's incredibly screwed up and part of the same behaviors that we see in cults wow is is that the hidden curriculum what you just defined because i don't actually know what hidden curriculum means the hidden curriculum is not the obvious curriculum of what you have to learn to become a doctor. It's the culture, it's the norms, it's the, the behaviors that are modeled, like professionalism is a feature of the hidden curriculum. Self-sacrifice is a feature of the hidden curriculum. One right way, or what is considered evidence or mm. knowledge, what is constitutes relevant knowledge. Mm -hmm. which ignores cultural, traditional knowledge and other ways of knowing and learning. Uh, there's a very black and white thinking, which is also a feature of narcissism. There's just one way of seeing things. So uh, the pathologizing human experience or the deficit-based approach to seeing humans, problem-based instead of whole person and what might be going on, it's actually helping them with their health, but we're only gonna look, look at the problem and try to kill the problem. Um, and in doing so, we might kill the patient, but, you know, we're going to do other things. There's going to be collateral damage because we're focusing on this thing and not the whole, not the ecosystem, just the, the one thing um, that we think is important, depending on the specialty that we're in. <laughs> and so that those are a, a few of the features. Um, yeah, perfectionism is, is one of them, because mm -hmm. if you're not, you're going to kill your patient. So embeds fear and shame is the weapon. Shaming and shame is the weapon that's used mm -hmm. to keep people in line. Wow. Yeah. Resonates so much. Everything you said. That's, yeah. That's my so story. those are just a few. There's like a number of um, characteristics of the hidden curriculum. Um, and it's, again, how it's modeled through the leaders and the authorities who are training the doctors the students wow so natalie i'm gonna ask you a little bit of a i guess it's a little bit of a meta question <laughs> um given that you know we've kind of talked about how even altruism in a sense is narcissistic in nature how do you keep yourself from not getting jaded like even just right now i feel cynical and sad and i'm just like I, I always thought I was a good person, but maybe now I'm not as good as I thought I was. 
Well, there's, why do I need to believe I'm a good person? I know myself, I know what I'm doing, or I'm, you know, trying to do my best. And uh, whether or not that means I'm a good person is kind of irrelevant to me. Mm -hmm. Good person is how others see me. Am I going to make someone's narrative of me more important than how I see myself? Because I'm not hacking narcissism, doing everything to please others. I'm not doing anything to uphold my values and feel good about myself from a place of knowing that I'm, I'm living my way. That's true to me. And that comes with time and life experience and wisdom that you develop over the years of, you know, so I think especially as women that you're in uh, lots of places that are male dominated in a world that was shaped mainly by men mm -hmm. that's still being, you know, finding a way for women to have some more and more say, but um, you know, it wasn't shaped by someone like me. So why am I going to uphold its values? There are things that make sense that feel right to me. But at some point, I have to be able to distinguish between what's true to me and what has been internalized from the world around me. And that picking apart is what gives me the strength to go, okay, I'm clear about what my principles are. Uh -huh. And if I make a wrong step, I'm going to know it. I'm going to trust that my conscious won't will nag me and let me know I've done the wrong thing mm -hmm. and that I'm prepared to listen and make amends and, mm -hmm. you know, repair the damage I did to myself. But also if there was anyone else involved that I need to do that with them too. Mm -hmm. And that is my own ethical value system, which might look different to everyone else's. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. And how do I prevent being cynical? Well, I'll be judgmental from time to time. And that's me expecting people to do differently instead of accepting that this is what they're doing now. This is where they're at. And it's their life has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. um, and they might be doing things that hurt others. And I don't want that to happen. But that's also between them. Like I have my own like hurts and things that I, I, I have my own you know, house and backyard to like clean up and my own little mm -hmm. community that I need to pay attention to. If I'm constantly distracted by everything else going around me, it's mm -hmm. an avoidance tactic for me doing what I need to do for myself. Um, and then I also recognize we've all had adverse experiences. We've all had, we've all been parented by parents who were not attuned to mm -hmm. our needs because of whatever they were going through. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that has had extremely detrimental effects on people who are adults now, mm -hmm. um, who are emotionally stunted children in adult bodies. And, um, and, you know, that gives me hopefully compassion to understand what might be driving someone's behavior mm -hmm. but explains it but it doesn't mean I have to you know uh be on the receiving end of it that's where I have boundaries okay and that's part of me living into my values as well so I can it's and the only way I've been able to get to that is because I've had to recognize those things in myself where I've been hurtful to people where I've caused harm where I've been an ass when I've you know, when I haven't been regulated and taken my stuff out on people and still do. Mm -hmm. So I have to acknowledge that I do these things and I'm going to judge those things and others that I still haven't refined and mm -hmm. accepted in myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and we have, we're just humans are humans doing human things. We're never going to be, there's no perfect. Um, but I also know because people are coming from different life experiences and upbringings, I can't trust them right away. I can't give anyone trust right away. Doesn't mean I'm never going to trust. Doesn't mean I have to be unfriendly. I could be warm and friendly with anyone. Mm -hmm. I just don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to trust them. That has to come with time. Mm -hmm. And I'm also acknowledging I'm only going to form mutual relationships with few people in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have the capacity to have mutual relationships with everyone. Mm -hmm. I might be in a bunch of hierarchical relationships because that's what the context requires. That's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Might have transactional relationships with lots of people. But there'll be a few that I'm going to invest my time and energy in and preserve because these are necessary for my well-being. Mm -hmm. So that's a long answer. How do, how do we how do I not be cynical? Just we can't hold people's behaviors against them. And as much as we'd like people to take accountability for the act, the impacts of their action, not everyone can. Not everyone wants to. Mm -hmm. Not everyone would be ready for it. Mm 
because the way mm. they're living works for them and it's helping mm. them to survive and succeed and do the things. It becomes mm. a problem when their way negatively impacts me. Mm. And that's when I'm going to be considering actions. So what, what I'm hearing, I guess what I'm hearing and I, and uh, you know I'd like you to say whether this is accurate or not is the way to I guess address narcissism or narcissistic type behavior in yourself would be mindfulness uh boundaries and self-compassion would that be fair to say not mindfulness mindfulness no. can make you aware of the thoughts and feelings you have inside but that doesn't give you anything that promotes transformation what mm -hmm. i'm referring to is more of a critical self-examination so but i need to know what i'm examining so i have to you know, also be clear about my principles. Like I want, I want to have positive effects on people. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had an interaction and I came away from it feeling like, Ooh, something feels off, then I need to spend some time going what's off about it. What happened? What was it? What was said? Is it off because of something I, my actions that mm -hmm. were incongruent with my values, or was it off because of something that they did and said that made me feel shitty about myself? Mm -hmm. or where I'm feeling shitty about myself because of something that happened from their end. Mm -hmm. That takes time to tease apart. Mm -hmm. And then if it was something that I did, then I need to kind of go into another, you know, understanding of what, why did I do that? What was going on that motivated me to act in that way or say that thing. Mm -hmm. And I would probably need somebody to debrief with to help me become more, give me more insight about my, that experience and to be supported to consider actions I would need to take to prevent that in the future, as mm -hmm. well as to rectify that with that person mm -hmm. or to find out if they've been negatively impacted. And if it impacted me and didn't them, I'd be wondering what the hell, how, mm -hmm. how did it not impact them? What does that say about our relationship? And maybe there is a power differential when I thought there was equality. Mm -hmm. So it, it like the examination process raises a whole mm -hmm. lot of other things mm -hmm. um, that we didn't anticipate. And then we have to be prepared to do something with it instead of just like, you know, burying it mm -hmm. and not changing. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness is just that it's not adequate for mm -hmm. hacking narcissism okay. because it's not getting us to ask ourselves, what is the effect of that I'm having on other people or what was the effect I had or what did I do and what was the impact and was it what I expected or wanted? So basically having a degree of emotional intelligence, it sounds like. Emotional be... intelligence, you could use mindfulness, but you need to add in a critical reflection. Okay. And critical... you can't just do it in your own head. You also need to be doing it with other people who you trust to help you gain insight about yourself, whether it's a professional, whether it's a friend who you can, who can do this with you. And then you'd have to be willing to take the action mm -hmm. or at least consider the action you would need to take. And, you know, whether or not you could take it is a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what might the action be? Like, what's an example of an action? Um, you're in a friendship with someone. Things have been great all along. Um, but you notice this other, this friend starting to say less and less in the conversation. They're less inclined to give their opinion. Um, so you st I start becoming suspicious, like what's going on? I feel like something's off. So I'm going to test something out in in our next conversation to see if I get a different response so I might go what do you think about that and I'm going to expect that if things are fine they'll give me their opinion but if things are not fine they're going to just kind of brush it off and go yeah it's all you know yeah I think the same way when I know them enough to know that they probably have an opinion so I come away from that conversation going okay something's up uh why aren't they being open with me why are they not sharing their opinion when in the past they had what is happening? So depending on the relationship I have with this person, I might, my action is I need to ask them what's going on because I notice something is off and I don't want something to be off between us. I want both of us to be able to talk openly with each other because it's not fulfilling when it's just me talking and, you know, sharing my opinion and the other person's just agreeing. So, and that never used to be like that. So what's changed? And then that's one action. Another action is, I could examine myself and go, okay, this, per, you know, do like a historical 
analysis of what was our relationship like in our conversations? Have they always not shared their opinion and I've been the one who's stronger? And if that's the case, then, oh, how interesting they don't feel like they could share their opinion with me. What might I be doing that could be preventing it? Have I shut them down in the past? And that told them it's not safe to share my opinion unless it's the one that agrees with Matt. So there's mm -hmm. the inner reflection or, and then there's the outer action where I actually ask this friend what the hell's going on, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go what the hell's going on. Or I notice something's off without having reflected a little bit myself just to kind of think about the different things that could be contributing to this weirdness that I'm feeling between us. Because if I have hurt that person and I haven't self-reflected, and then I go to that person going, I'm noticing something's up. Can you tell me what's going on? If they're feeling hurt by me, they're not going to feel safe to even tell me the truth. Whereas if I've spent time reflecting, I might bring in some of this awareness that I have. And that might make them go, okay, Nat, she's a, Nat's aware. Okay. Now I feel like I can confirm it. Mm, there's exactly. so much going on in these little interactions yeah the interpersonal safety that you can create yeah and mm. some people might go not you're overthinking it you know you should just be able to say what's on your mind and people should be able to say that too I'm like yeah that would be nice i wish i wish that were the case that would be nice. but we have too many wounds from our mm. life to yeah. enable that without having cultivated a relationship where we know for sure that we can do that with each other we're not just taking risks. We know it and we feel secure to do that. There was an acronym. Did you say Dar DARVO? I, I, th <laughs> I think there's might be some value for the audience to, to understand a little bit more or at least know how to read more about that. Okay. Yeah. So these that is a type that is one of the narcissistic behaviors. So I, I've compiled a list of about 20 narcissistic behaviors. Oh. Things that any of us would do when we're feeling threatened or uncomfortable to try to restore a sense of, to restore stability, a sense of control, a sense of order, and a sense of power. Um, so one of the things, one of the behaviors is known as DARVO, and that was uh, developed by Dr. Jennifer Freed, who's written extensively about institutional be betrayal. Um, and DARVO is one of the, the words, the acronyms. So it stands for, D is for deny, A is for accusation, so deny the accusation, R is reverse, V is victim, and O is offender. So a scenario, I'm talking to Lawrence and um, you know I noticed something weird between us. So, and it was something Lawrence said to me that didn't land right. And I felt wounded by it. I felt really hurt. Uh, it was a dig at me. And I, I confront Lawrence because I feel like, okay, we have a friendship and I would think he would want to know about this so that he, maybe he could change something or correct or whatever, I'm just bringing it to his awareness. So I tell him, Hey, Lawrence, you know, the other day when we're chatting, you said this thing and I felt really hurt by it. And I'm, wondering, you know, I'm not assuming you intended to hurt me, but I'm wondering well, what's up, what's going on? And Lawrence goes, I don't know what you're talking about, Nat. You're ridiculous. Like you're always, you're hypersensitive and you're always bringing stuff to me that is completely irrelevant. Um, you know, if you weren't so sensitive, maybe we would be able to have a conversation without you, you know, me, me having to walk on eggshells around you. Because whenever I talk to you, I always feel like I have to be cautious because you know, I never know what's going to hurt your feelings. <laughs> so that was Darvo. It sounds like gaslighting. It is gaslighting. It's exactly. Yeah. So it's trying to make me seem like I'm, in, I'm crazy mm -hmm. for bringing this up. And he's making it seem like I've made it a bigger deal than the way I've been raising it, like the way I raised it. So he's working hard to deflect and take zero responsibility, not even listen to it, not even consider it, couldn't care less about the relationship, clearly, um, because he's wounded and his needs matter more than anything. And how dare I? I should be there placating him. I should be begging his forgiveness now. Wow. This is powerful stuff. <laughs> Darvo. The Darvo gaslight. Yeah, I guess it is 
Guess I'm not going to lie. It's actually quite frightening because it just, you know, especially as a woman, a woman of color, um, I'm just very sensitive to power dynamics. And it's just a very frightening position that I would never want to be in or have anybody else be in to be so disempowered that they couldn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because you've been there or you go there. And yeah. so that you have empathy, which is also fundamental for hacking narcissism. Mm -hmm. So if we consider I could have a negative impact on someone and I would never want someone to go through what I've gone through or what I felt, that's going to that's gonna influence how you treat others. But for those who've never taken time to reflect on their experiences and have always been the victim of their circumstance and everyone should be looking after me and everyone else is responsible for my happiness, then there's very little empathy and there's very little empathic capacity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of us began our life that way. Mm -hmm. Empathy erodes over time with loss of trust, betrayals, and not having modeling to help us reflect on ourselves or the impact on things or make sense of what's going on <clears throat> and when we are able to like look at our wounds and try to make sense of things that helps us preserve empathy because we're well as long as it doesn't become a self-absorbed exercise where it's like I need to gain insight and I'm happy I get my euphoric aha moment and I don't do anything with it and I don't change as a result of it I'm just uh, high on the feel-good um, aspects mm -hmm. of insights gaining insight mm -hmm. um, yeah so it's it's important to spend time learning you know visiting our experiences and the impacts that things have had so that we could make sense of it but also like hang on to our humanity mm -hmm. and make us more tuned into the another person and mm -hmm. less likely to want to wound them in the same way we've been wounded mm -hmm. doesn't mean it won't happen mm -hmm. but we also know because we have empathy if i did wound somebody else then i'm going to go through that uncomfortable process of you know examining my actions mm -hmm. rectifying it within myself and then going and doing the uncomfortable but important thing with that other person mm -hmm. or trying to they may not ever want to talk to me again mm -hmm. wow so we spoke a little bit about uh, in hacking narcissism how we could we might, we might make shifts in ourselves around that awareness and working with a coach or partner or friend and then taking action to rectify and shift relationships to, to one where the power gradient is, is less. If we are in a relationship with someone who we identify to be uh, behaving narcissistically pretty mm. consistently, we can extricate ourselves as, as I think Jerome said earlier, or we could, tr we could try to be assertive maybe and, and, and be a mirror for this person and mm. do you have any tips around that um, yeah so cautionary no not everyone's gonna mm. want to change to meet you in the middle and that's part of the you know upsetting discovery process of uh of being assertive and or or you know wanting to hack narcissist your own narcissism not everyone's going to want to be on that road with you. And sometimes you discover this in relationships that have been lifelong or, you know, long periods of time where you felt like you were traveling together. Um, and you know this because when you're trying to create change or not even telling them that you want them to change, you're, you're doing the work on yourself to, to improve yourself and to learn and grow. And as a result, certain relationships become less palatable to you because you're seeing features in those other people that you've known for a long time that now no longer uh, make you feel good around them. But they haven't changed, you've changed. So what people tend to do is that I want them to change alongside me so that we can continue this relationship. But that's not necessarily realistic because you're they're on their journey, you're on yours. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so then it's a, it's a negotiating. Can I, can I continue to be in a relationship with that person in the same way, given that there are now things that they're doing that I see are quite toxic, but I didn't see it before, but my tolerance to it is less because maybe I've developed better boundaries. And so now those features that never bug, bug me are now bugging me. And they're actually annoying me to the point where I don't want to be around them as much, or mm -hmm. I don't want to relate to them in the same way. So I could tell them what they're doing that's pissing me off, but that might piss them off or they might placate me and you know make me feel good because there's something about me that is meeting their needs, but then they'll repeat the same behaviors at some point again. And we'll go through the cycle over and over and over until eventually I just, you know, the writing's on the wall and I need to just end, end this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to, I think, most of us in our life. If one of the parties in the relationship is doing, again, the self-examination, self-improvement, learning, and applying that in their, in their relationships. It, it won't be so that relationship with people who are not doing that won't be sustainable so basically having a growth mindset is key it sounds like is it growth mindset or is it a is this a different attitude about relating because i see growth mindset again about an individual okay. learning my capacity to open my mind and consider other okay. ways of seeing versus something that happens in a relationship fair enough i guess because I, we can go yeah sorry go on i guess i just see it as when you have a growth mindset you're aware that something's wrong and you want to do something about it and so in this context it would be how you relate interpersonally that's that's mm -hmm. how i was looking at it okay yeah that makes sense so you have a curious mindset you're yeah mm -hmm. you're willing to learn you want to grow mm -hmm. um and then notice how certain things that start to challenge you in a relationship that alerts mm -hmm. you to something to delve into a little further. Why is this, why is this challenging me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not all relationships will be easy to end. Some will be quite difficult to end because you might have realized that what you thought was an equitable, you know, sort of sharing power relationship was actually a codependent one and you're both enmeshed and, you mm -hmm. want to now have space because you realize the other person has been draining you. Um, but you never knew that that was what was behind your tiredness, your fatigue. You now have been able to connect your fatigue to that person or that group of people. And you want to extract yourself from that. But they've been using you as an emotional or an energy or money supply for a long time. They're not going to let you go easily. So the yeah. way you extract yourself out of that is going to be quite different than a relationship where it just seems to fizzle out because mm. you're no longer relate. So there are differences and it's a lot trickier when there's codependence. Mm. Wow. This is great. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> um, the, the way that you were so easy, so easily able to verbalize these complex ideas is, uh, mm -hmm. is, astound mm -hmm. is astounding to me. It's, um, mm -hmm. oh, thank uh, you. It's very nuanced and it's not something that I've heard or seen before. If mm -hmm. people wanted to learn more from you about your writing, um, Natalie, where should they go? Uh, I want to bring it up on screen so that uh, viewers could actually try to, to go there. So is mm. it, you, I'm sure you have a website. Uh, um, I have a Substack. Substack, okay, yeah. Hacking what Narcissism. Substack? substack is a writing platform. It's fantastic. Oh, okay. Yeah, Hacking Narcissism on Substack. Two S's, one. Yeah, there. <laughs> there, that's me. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, Natalie Martinek, PhD .substack.com. Yeah, that's me. And so... Uh, oh, a lot that. of what we've been talking about, uh, or like summary of it in an article that came out in <laughs> December, that's in Toronto. That was on my, my last trip oh, to North America. I, I had to like pull over right away when I saw the sign. <laughs> <laughs> <Take a photo. laughs> so 
that one at the top is my most recent. I am releasing one today on toxic positivity. Um, but this one I'm very proud of because it really, again, frames this experience of shame that we all have through the lens of our context and what shaped us to feel or think the things that we do about ourselves that are not actually shame or they're not what we've been told shame is about. So um, yeah, so I break down shame in di different kind of scenarios. And uh, again, it's all about our aligning or tuning to our moral principles and knowing the difference between what's our moral principles and the norms that are outside of us or the, the moral behaviors that are expected, uh, that we're expected to uphold mm -hmm. and the consequences of not upholding them. Um, and then uh, late last year, I published a piece on narcissism. Um, I mean, they're all about narcissism, but it's, it's narcissism and narcissistic behaviors, an overview, November last year. There we go. So that's that. So that that article that piece kind of encapsulates a lot of what we discussed today and mm -hmm. uh yeah there's i make reference to like dark tetrad which we talked about and narcissistic behaviors and um a whole bunch of other things mm. traits and different features of the spectrum including collective narcissism why context matters the mm. behavior Narcissistic behavior checklist, checklist and what is what narcissism is not how do you know if you caught it yeah yeah <laughs> you know if you caught it yes you contagious know, narcissism <laughs> yeah well that's actually true like again you think about um hmm. a workplace that is psychologically safe versus one that isn't one that isn't hmm. everyone's going to be defensive reactive you know yeah yeah, that's true. Using those narcissistic behaviors because you're all in survival mode. Whereas if yeah. you're in a psychologically safe environment, everyone's on the same page of how we can be with each other. There's no need for that. Mm -hmm. Or if you do slip, you're, you're not going to be condemned for it. People will be like, oh, are you okay? What's going on? How can we support you with whatever it is that's going mm -hmm. on right now? We show mm -hmm. caring and want to connect versus disengage, disconnect, and make everyone your enemy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, this discussion has been enlightening, challenging. Mm -hmm. It has been mm -hmm. challenging. I I can sense that Iram is like, yeah, first. Oh. <laughs> she's like, whoa. She's like, her energy. She's like, I need to re I need to sleep for a week. Like that's what I, that's the energy I'm sensing. From I need to now. just reflect. Process <laughs> for a long time. Yeah. And, you had questions. <laughs> uh oh, yeah, that was awesome. No, this Did is you, really thank you is there like a takeaway i know we there was a lot that we covered but is there like something that stands out that mm -hmm. you're going to continue to think about i actually wrote some notes down um for me the big takeaways were intentions matter but so does the impact need to pay attention to both and that's actually something that you can kind of clue in as a narcissistic trait that if somebody just kind of intends good but doesn't focus on the impact that is essentially a narcissistic trait um tackling narcissism requires the ability to do a critical self-examination hold and respect boundaries and self-compassion um how do you keep from being cynical after learning all of the above basically know what your values are and principles are and make sure to self-reflect don't worry about whether other people think you're good just be good and be authentic um and then I also wrote down, how do you tell a covert narcissist apart from a truly kind, empathetic person? And that was essentially, you know, um, the, the truly kind, empathetic person feels confident to express themselves as essentially authentic, humility, self-restraint, self-regulation, aware of what they know and don't know, um, tolerance to discomfort, able to manage emotions, reciprocity in relationships. So those are some of the big takeaways that for me mm. personally. Thank you. Wow. What a summary. <laughs> I'm curious, Natalie, was there anything that you know, just uh, reported out that you'd like to comment on? Or? Mm. Yeah, I'm always like um, interested in what sticks out to people. And I guess that gives an indication of you know, what's important to them, what's going to stand out to them is what they've been thinking about or, or curious about. So, yeah. Was any of it inaccurate, I should add, or was that 
fairly representative of what you yeah. discussed. Yeah, it's yeah, you summarized and there was nothing inaccurate in what you shared. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what what stood out for me was um kind of that 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 motivation that that there's that someone with narcissistic traits or personality is that they're it's a survival mechanism and it's serving them serving a purpose mm -hmm. and that our culture the re the fact that we see it diagnosed so rarely is because our culture it's it's almost in line with our culture our culture almost <laughs> supports the existence of narcissism and narcissistic traits it's a functional disorder <laughs> where it can actually assist one to survive and do well in life to succeed um that's and it but but it is so caustic and potentially toxic to so many so mm. it kind of speaks to the metrics that we're using to determine whether or not our culture is is well and good that we we might not be focusing on the appropriate metrics yeah our culture is unwell very unwell mm. <laughs> and it just yeah what it values tells you everything Hmm. Um, I'd yeah. like to give you an opportunity. Any final closing thoughts? If not, oh, well, thank you for hosting us and um, stimulating my thinking. Because you know, I didn't know what you were going to ask me, and I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. So uh, <laughs> I have no idea. So. It's always good. So thank you. You might not thank know you. it, but it's always <laughs> inspiring. Uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. Oh. This was a great discussion. And um, I, thank you so much. It was very thought provoking. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, keep asking those questions. And uh, thank you for indulging me for like an hour and a half to talk about the topic that is, you know, I love talking about mm -hmm. um, and trying to provide a an angle or point of view that doesn't pathologize each other or ourselves, that is more accepting of our nature and why we do what we do. And that we can change, but not everyone will. Mm -hmm. That's another takeaway. We can change, mm -hmm. but not everyone will. I'm mm -hmm. going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> if people want to, I know you got the Substack, Natalie. If people wanted to engage with you on social media, where should they go? Uh, good question. LinkedIn, Twitter. Are you still doing Clubhouse at all? Or Clubhouse? I'm on it, but I'm I'm not um like active i'm not actively running rooms i keep contemplating it but no um linkedin and twitter are the best places to to find me okay uh, i'll be try to put those on the screen uh, how about you you know are you interested in publicly interacting with anybody i do have a twitter account that i just started up but i haven't oh. posted anything <laughs> on it yet oh get on it <laughs> Get you some Let's followers. feed the addiction. Let's get yes, the narcissist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As I do more and more work on my um, destigmatizing mental illness project, I will be hopefully creating more of a public presence. Okay. Um, but for now, there's nothing on my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's get your followers up. Uh, <laughs> the five people watching. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's what's your handle on Twitter? Hold on, let me find out. Okay, Natalie, she Natalie, while she does that, what's your handle on Twitter? My handle is at Nats for Docs, D O C S. That's N A T S, the number four, D O C S. No, it's the, no, it's the word F O R. <laughs> My bad. And that's for Docs. N A T S F O R D O C S. Yeah. What's yours, Iram? So mine is uh, basically my name uh, at Iram, I R A M underscore Yunus, Y-U-N-U-S. Okay. Easy. Uh, yeah. Underscore. Yeah. Underscore. And I'm at Gateway Medic. Thank you, everybody. Gateway Medic. I'm going to stop the recording now. Oh, my God. That was so good. <laughs>